So last week we learned um, why the Gospel of John was written, mm -hmm. down towards the end of the Gospel of John, and chapter 20, verse 31, it says, but these are written that you may, do you remember? Believe. believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Then we saw a beautiful description written by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, or John, declaring the deity of Jesus Christ, who is the Word, right? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So here we see that Jesus was already there. And we saw two distinct persons within those scriptures, the Father and the Son. And that was the out of the three in the Godhead. And that he, Jesus, was in the beginning before creation. And it was all summed up in two verses. Now, when you, as we go through this, it's going to be the continuous thing. It's going to be the continuous thing in, these, in this prologue of the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, the thing about John that's interesting is that he'll start going on a certain path and do really well. And all of a sudden, the stop comes in and he's, <laughs> and he goes in that direction. And then he'll take you there, but then he looks back and, and <laughs> continues on. And we're going to see that here. Now, if I was one of those guys that can just sit there and go, okay, here, like, you know, minority report, I'm going to put this right here and there. I can do it all in yeah. sequence, but we're just going to go verse by verse. <laughs> okay. So, let's look at uh, verse 3. It says, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. So all things were made through him, just as we saw last week in uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17 that Paul wrote. He said, for him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. So he is before all things and in him all things consist, right? Yeah. All things are held together through Jesus. All things were created through him. Jesus was not a created being, okay? Jesus is the creator. Anyone confused? <laughs> it's pretty clear, right? Yeah. He is not a created being. And last week we learned that only the Jehovah's Witnesses can confuse the scriptures. <laughs> all things were created through him, and he is the object for which all things were created for. He created you. You were created through him and for him. Just like David said in Psalm 139, he says, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well my frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So Christian, he created you for himself. Right? He loves everything about you. He knows everything every detail about you written in the book. He has a plan for your life. It's documented, right? He knows all your days fashioned ahead of you. What a wonderful truth of our Creator concerning us. Amen? Mm -hmm. So all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Verse 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now, there are three words in the Greek language used for life. The first one would be bios. The Greek word refers to the life of the physical body and is where we get the word biology. The second was, <laughs> it's a funny looking word, but I believe it's souk, which is the Greek word here refers to the psychological life of the human soul, that is the mind, the emotion, and will. It's where we get the, the root word or word psychology. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring that up is those words were also used throughout the New Testament in, in Luke and in Matthew. All right, but it, here in John, it uses the word Zoe, not Zoe. Don't look at me. <laughs> Zoe. Okay. Okay. Here, the Greek word refers to the uncreated eternal life of God. 
the divine life mm-hmm. uniquely possessed by God. So I had to sit there and I had to think about that, right? So God is eternal. How does our mind wrap around that? That God has always been there. He's always been existent. It's hard to even fathom because we always tend to think by beginning and an end mm-hmm. that there is a start and there's a finish. He says he's the alpha and he's omega. Guess what? There's no beginning. There's no way. He is the beginning and end. That means he covers it all. Mm-hmm. So in him was life. And the way that is described is he is the source. He's the source of life. Okay? It isn't that the word contains life. It is that he is the source of life. All right? And the life was the light of men, which is, you know, the natural. It's the spiritual. Okay? We see both of them. He was the life. He was the light. And it, they both, he is the source. He is the life. He is the light. Completeness, fullness. Then he's before all things. And remember, all things consist in him. Okay, verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, or the darkness did not overcome the light. And the light will never, ever be overcome by the darkness. Okay. And then a nice, interesting passage. Jesus says that you are the light of the world. Interesting, right? Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, For you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the world. Walk as children of light. And how do we know this is true? How do we know the truth of walking in the light? So turn to 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Okay, the Spirit of who? Uh-huh. Dwells where? Mm-hmm. And in John, who is the Word? Jesus. Okay. <laughs> and Jesus is? The light? Exactly. <laughs> okay, so that's no, how we know. No. <laughs> that's how we know, all right? Jesus dwells within us, and through the Holy Spirit, we are. this is the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. But here's a truth and a contrast to that. David Guzik wrote, and I quote, Without Jesus, we are dead and in darkness. We are lost. Significantly, man has an inborn fear towards both death and darkness. So, Christian, what are we supposed to do with our light? <laughs> Matthew 5, 16. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So by doing this, just by being that light, right, which means you need to have fellowship with Jesus. In mm-hmm. 1 John, it says, in him there's no darkness at all. All right. Everything points to God. The glory, everything points to God. What he's doing in your life, they're not seeing you. They're seeing what God's doing in you, what God's doing through you. Notice it doesn't say, let your shine, your light shine so bright before man <laughs> that they may hear your marvelous Christianese <laughs> and may say, no, I'm joking. They see you're good, but it's how we live our lives, right? It's our witness. And the thing is, is people are watching. People are watching. So by being a light around those who are in darkness, they will see Jesus in you through how you live. And it exposes a lot in their own life, just being next to you. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 6, there was a man, no, here goes John, he's going right here real quick in left field, but he's still referencing the light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Keep in mind, by looking at these verses, first, John, the Baptist, the baptizer, was sent from God. He was a messenger. And second, approximately over 400 years had passed between the last prophet, Malachi, to John the baptizer when he was sent. 
So there was a silence from God for over 400 years. So here comes this guy, and people are probably going, whoa, who, who's this dude? You know, his hair is cool. What's up with that? <laughs> Verse 7, this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him I believe. So John was sent with a message to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. He was the one who would recognize him and point the world to him. He was the voice who basically announced when royalty is entering the room. All right. He was announcing the coming of our king. Verse 8. He, John, was not that light. If you guys, just in case you guys in here were thinking. <laughs> he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So obviously, he wasn't the light. He was there to bear witness. But he was bearing witness of what the scriptures spoke mm -hmm. concerning the light that was coming. This is the people in Isaiah 9 2 who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. And also in Isaiah 49 6, it says, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So the light. Is coming and that's a very important task so mm -hmm. although John the Baptist is significant he wasn't at that light he was not that light but he was the guy that was gonna identify mm -hmm. there he is this is the light of the world and that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world and I had to look at that and I'm just like John in other words you're saying that was the true light which Coming into the world gives life to every man. So, you know, English kind of kicks in every now and then. <laughs> but he was talking about the true light. True meaning the one, real, the exact, the fact, the correct, the promised light. He was talking about the true light. It's like when you're pointing out, no, no, that's the one. Yeah. That's my child. You know, yeah. that's how he was put, pointing it out. And notice... And circle in your mind the word gives. Because Jesus, who was the light, he came to give mankind light. That spiritual, you know, light. Mm -hmm. When you see this verse, you see why the light came. He says to give light to man. To reconcile the created back to himself. Right? Mm -hmm. We know that we have the tricon the was it triconomy? Mm -hmm. And and when the man fell, we ended up becoming a dichotomy. We're supposed to be the image of God, but now we're, we died in the spirit. So he's replacing that. So the spirit's what unifies us. And here, he's setting that tone right away, that he is the light to come in, that spiritual light. So John was ready and watching, ready to, like, where is he at? You know, <laughs> watching, ready for the witness, to, to, to bear witness of that light. So verse 10. Now John flips back to who he is. He goes, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. You know, our history today tells us about this one man named Jesus Christ who came to this world and changed the course of our history. He came to his own creation, and the world did not even know him. Yet, creation itself knew him. Right? When, Je when Jesus said, peace be still, when he was out in the sea, the sea obeyed. Mm -hmm. Or what about when uh, they were about to go into the triumphant entry and everybody's screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, mm -hmm. right? And the Pharisees called them out from the crowd and said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, tell them to be quiet. Mm -hmm. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Mm -hmm. Not to mention demons who were confronted by Jesus, they knew who he was. Mm -hmm. And here, the world didn't have a clue who he was. Verse 11, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. He came to his own creation, his domain, right? Yeah. Hey, I created, it's like, you know, you create this beautiful thing, now you're in this creation, your own domain. And he was rejected by his own, as prophesied in Isaiah 53, 3. But, but these are by those people who should have been waiting for him and watching for him. It says in Isaiah, it says, 
He is despised and rejected by men. And Luke 9, 14 even takes it further and says, His citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So here, after 400 years, and you got John waiting and all that ready to go, and Jesus finally comes, we see the heart of his people when he came to them. What would have been the greatest sign in, the, in his triumphant entry, and yet they still did not receive him because they didn't know him. But look how Jesus responds during this event in human history in Luke 19.41. If you can turn there real quick. It's one small little verse, but to me it says everything. Luke 19.41. You there? Could you read it? Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. So as he's on the donkey making his way, he sees the city, and he wept. Mm -hmm. They were so far from God as if they were God. Mm -hmm. But then it caused me to think. I'm like, you know, do you ever notice in your life that the more you push your personal time with the Lord in prayer or in the Word, it happens kind of in baby steps? Mm -hmm. You know, you're thinking, oh, it's innocent, right? Yeah. First, you have reasons why you can't, you know, have that time at that moment. Then soon, slowly, it turns into an excuse why you couldn't, you know. And little by little, it works its way down to the priorities list. Mm -hmm. It starts working down this way because everything else becomes more important. Next thing, you reason with yourself that it's okay because you've got church on Sundays and Wednesday. I'm good. I go. So you're justified. But then life comes up and wants to crowd out, you know, a Wednesday. Okay, to the point when you're so tired of the week, Sunday morning, missing one week, that won't hurt. But you're good, you're still good, I still go, I'm a good Christian, right? All this is going on, not even realizing that the progression has already begun, drawing you further and further away from the Lord. And it's kind of like one who floats, you know, is close to the shore, he's sitting on, on his float mm -hmm. on the lake, and he just keeps an eye on everything and then just decides to just drift off in thought. Meanwhile, not even realizing he's drifting. Mm -hmm. But by the time they do realize, that shore is way, way far, mm -hmm. right? Very far. They didn't even know how far they were until they, they looked up. And when I say this, I'm speaking for myself. And that's why it's my priority to, to be in his word every day. And most importantly, to be in prayer with him every day. But the good news is, is that it only takes one step back. To God, amen. Mm -hmm. It's really awesome. But over 400 years have passed. They don't know how far they drifted, right? And God was silent. They took their eyes off of God. And Israel didn't even know him. That he was the promised Messiah. The one they've been waiting for. And they rejected him. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them... He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So I'm like, oh, praise God, there's some good news here, right? <laughs> but notice the word received. It is our part to receive him and embrace him. He does not force man to him. He gave us free will. So it's up to man to receive him. And praise God, like I said, in this particular time, as John's recalling, he's remembering all those people that did receive him that became children of God, just like us here tonight. When we received him, we became his children. So when the Father sees us, he sees his Son in us. Jesus gave the right by his authority to those who believed in his name to become children of God, who were not born, not of blood, or I'm saying who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So here we're looking at uh, the nature of this birth that we're talking about, this whole spiritual birth. Mm -hmm. It wasn't by blood, speaking about the genealogies of being born into a bloodline, nor of the will of the flesh, you know, through your parents, mm -hmm. because, you know, they're my parents, then I automatically become, you know, it's not that, or the will of man by their own merit. Mm -hmm. There's nothing mankind can do or earn or merit to be called a child of God. Mm -hmm. It's God's sovereign gift. To us and we must receive the gift which is his son Jesus mm -hmm. 
Now, here goes John. He's going back to the thought from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. This hit him. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he was there in the beginning with God. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh from eternal to time, the infinite to the finite. Jesus became flesh so we may know the truth about God the Father. Not how man has perceived him with, you know, the Old Testament. They're thinking that, oh, this guy is all about judgment, yes. fire, mm -hmm. anger, commands. But to show us the truth concerning the Father. And he became flesh, full of grace and truth, which means that you cannot have any more than what he's given. It's, mm -hmm. You're maxed out. Jesus brought all the deity with him, and he was full of grace and full of truth when he came. Jesus said, if you've seen me concerning the Father, because he's here, you've seen the Father. He says, if you have known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. So when we want to see the Father and who God is, we look at Jesus. Mm -hmm. Study Jesus. And then Philip had the, the great mind, Lord, show us the Father, and then we'll, <laughs> that was sufficient for us. Jesus said to them, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Mm -hmm. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? These words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. <laughs> he came here in the flesh to show us the truth about the Father. God is love. God is merciful. He's full of grace. He's true. He's righteous. He's holy. And that's what Jesus displayed about the Father. Side note, this is where I got a little interesting, and I did my own little giant <laughs> squirrel kind of thing. Before we leave, the word became flesh in verse 14. It's also important to understand the what of what was going on during that time and the why this statement is so powerful and how it is wonderfully written. So let's take a look where the Gospels, and the Gospel of John, right, and the other Gospels, in contrast to the three synoptic Gospels, to see where they all begin. So Matthew begins with the genealogy, uh, genealogy of Jesus Christ that leads all the way to Abraham. Mark begins with John the Baptist. Luke begins with Zacharias learning that he was going to conceive, conceive a son named John the Baptist. And John begins before creation. And why would John begin before creation? Here's why. During the time, 85, 95 AD is the approximate, that this was written along with 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John 2, there were people, groups, and teachers, false teachers around, known as the Gnostics. Okay? They were circulating false teachings concerning Jesus to all who would listen. Problem was, is they were gaining an audience within the Christian community, the new believers. A little bit about the Gnostics. Oh, I call them Gnostics. <laughs> Gnats. <laughs> Bunch of Gnats. Okay, a little bit about the Gnostics, okay? Which was rejected as heresy in the second century, so I want to make sure I put that in there, okay? Mm -hmm. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which means knowledge or to know. They believed a blend of element, elements of like Christianity and a blend with blended with Greek philosophy, and this word, Zoro, when I studied it, I can't even, do you know how to pronounce it? Zoroastrianism? Thank you. <laughs> Zoroastrianism, which was a monotheistic pre-Islamic religion from ancient Persia, dated in 6th century BC. Hmm. See that? Oh, no, six times. <laughs> Bottom line, right there, what you see is, a, 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 to me, a dangerous blend mm -hmm. of teachings come into one. So they believed that the created world is evil. Mm -hmm. 
and that salvation comes through secret knowledge. And that man was separated in two, first being physical and second in spirit. The physical is evil, full of sin and darkness, and the soul spirit was pure like the creator. The problem is, is too, is that they tended to separate them and justify their sin when they were doing sexual stuff and, and things that were were just pure sin. They're just, oh, they're blaming it on their, their evil physical body. That's not going to work today. No. <laughs> But based on that theory, they had a different notion on Jesus, and this is kind of what they were teaching. God took mercy, and I'm quoting David Davidson because I thought that he put it really, really well. He says, God took mercy on darkened, matter-bound humanity, sending a Redeemer, a Redeemer whose body was, since flesh and pure spirit are incompatible, merely an illusion. Yeah. All right? Therefore, Jesus' physical crucifixion was also an illusion. Wow. All right? And I'll add that they believe this is part of one of their answers of how Jesus was resurrected through the Spirit. All right? Sort of a phantom who walked the earth and was not physical. And then later I also found out that they were trying to claim that, okay, well, he came in a physical body, but yet... Before he died, the body, the spirit left the body, so it didn't yeah. die. It just made no sense to him. But, okay. And yet this was drawing an audience, and people were being led astray. Paul warned Timothy early about these false teachings in 1 Timothy 6.20. He's like, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. All right. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So, so with all this was happening around John, you know, during this time as he's writing this, through the Holy Spirit, John writes concerning the Word. He begins with the Word, who was divine and eternal before creation, who was with God and who was God, and the Word became flesh. <laughs> it's truly remarkable. Because it would make it hard for Jews to even accept that God of the Old Testament took on human form. I mean, this whole thing was a startling statement. Mm -hmm. All right. But it, it would give them, you know, a really hard, hard accepting, you know, that God was human and dwelt among them on top of that. Mm -hmm. All the while the Greeks had created gods like, you know, mm -hmm. Zeus, who were like super beings that were not equal to what they call the order or supreme reason, logos, right? Mm -hmm. But with this statement, the logos became flesh. Mm -hmm. And let alone it blows the Gnostic beliefs that Jesus was all spirit. Mm -hmm. So again, this was startling. And what if that caused the Jews, Greeks, and Gentiles to pay close attention because the truth of the word of God demands attention. Mm -hmm. And note, this gospel was written approximately 60 years later after Jesus' resurrection. So this was still kind of fresh. It was still kind of on the minds of people. People were still looking into the life and teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this was still fresh. Now, I don't want you to focus too much on this part of it. I want to draw back. I want to go back to John. Where, you know, like how John was, my original thought was, mm -hmm. you know, was... That Jesus came in the world, right, in the flesh, so we may know the truth about the Father, to know the truth about God. There has been such a, a silence for 400, over 400 years that he came here and was like introducing people, hey, look at me, you'll see the Father. And he dwelt among us, and John says, and, be, and we beheld his glory. Circle that word. It's, it's such a good, we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, we beheld, meaning carefully studied, watched, touched, lived, seen, heard, everything. And described it also in 1 John, which I taught this earlier last year. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested. He came. Mm -hmm. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. And that's beautiful. 
It's wonderful. Then I also got to sit there and go, when was the last time I beheld God? When was the last time you guys sat down and just beheld God? Studied Him. Seeing what He has done in your life. Just took the time out. What He's doing now in your life. How He's taken you from glory to glory to glory. When you have time throughout your day, I, I exhort you guys, take that time. Mm -hmm. Give him the glory and behold your God. We are truly, truly blessed to be children of God. Mm -hmm. John declares that he has seen God the Son, but calls another witness who will also testify to his deity. Now, if you remember last week, I said they're going to, he's going to bring forth the witnesses. You know, he's going to talk about the seven miracles and the seven signs, right? So here's your first witness. He says, in verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John was watching. Like I said, he was waiting. He's out there baptizing people, holding them under the water for about, you know, a good second. So he starts shaking, <laughs> bringing them up. He, just doing that back and forth. But then he sees them. That moment happened. And when it came, he cried out and shouted. And I'm sure his eyes were fixed mm -hmm. on him. And oh, mm -hmm. we don't know exactly what John or how he saw him. Mm -hmm. But he knew. Mm -hmm. He knew. And the joy and excitement that he must have had in his voice would just, ah. Uh, and this is like him saying, this is what... You know, he of whom I said, I'm like, what, what is he talking about? It's like the word's coming out crazy. Mm -hmm. He who comes after me, mm -hmm. you know, for John was born before Jesus, mm -hmm. is preferred before me, because mm -hmm. he's a higher authority, he's king, for he was before me, declaring right here, mm -hmm. Jesus is deity. Mm -hmm. He is before all things. Verse 16, and of his fullness we have all received grace for grace but of and of his fullness we have all received his fullness Colossians 2 9 through 10 and I love this verse this might be something you guys want to to keep it it says for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power so in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily and guess what? As he's in you, you are complete in him. That blows my mind. And grace for grace. It says in verse 17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now grace for grace, which was a new order that was brought by Jesus other than the law given to Moses. He was about to just blow their minds with, hey, <laughs> Here's the grace. Mm -hmm. And people couldn't even comprehend. I still can't comprehend yeah. it when I look back at my life. Like, Lord, mm -hmm. me? Mm -hmm. I'm serious. But we are not given grace for the law because it's something that is unmerited favor. Mm -hmm. Right? We can't mm -hmm. earn it. But are free from the law, and through Jesus, we have grace for grace. The fullness and abundance of grace. Oh, do we ever need it. Mm -hmm. Verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So Jesus became flesh. Okay, like I said, I'm going to keep dragging in this because eventually down the road, we're going to have this so stuck in our minds that when it comes to preach to show the gospel or share the gospel mm -hmm. with somebody, it's going to flow. It's going to come out. He became flesh to declare to us, and you watch and also online, who God is. Mm -hmm. God created you and loves you. He sent you a gift in his son, Jesus, to pay the price on the cross for your sin once and for all. And if you receive Jesus and believe in him, he will forgive you of your sin and wash you clean, white as snow. He will enter in your heart and dwell in you and with you and give you a new life in him, a fresh start. 
And if you're listening and you want to receive Jesus into your life, first you must acknowledge that you are a sinner and in need of a Savior. Then believe in Jesus, confess him as Lord, and receive him in your heart. And if you're listening and want to receive Jesus, then I want you to say this prayer with me. And everyone, if you could repeat, I'd appreciate that. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. Right now, I turn from my sins. And open the door of my heart and life. And I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. <laughs> Your name is being written in the book of life while the angels are celebrating. And please, if you said this prayer, send me an email at info at TVF Calvary Chapel so I may welcome you in the family and guide you on your next step. All the blessings that God has given us is found in the gift of Jesus, who is God, who gives us all the fullness of him in our lives. And as we are the light, as he shines through us, you know, we'd be able to share the light with others that it may reflect Jesus' face, that they may see him. All we need to do is stand back, lean to the side a little bit, chill, deny ourselves, and let Jesus do his thing. God is good, right? Yeah. Let us pray.